Welcome back to Jason Bowman Loves Cars. I'm Jason Bowman, and I love cars. Today I'm going to tell you my story of the Omni GLH and the Shelby Charger. My best friend Dan's first car was a Shelby Charger. Carol Shelby was like a god to us, so owning something he created was like a dream come true. Dan drove the living crap out of that poor thing, as he did with every car he's ever owned. There are thousands of stories I could tell, but they're all very incriminating. I'll just tell this one because time has already been served. Growing up in car-crazed Milton, the popular thing to do was, and still is, to drive like a maniac in the escarpment. The escarpment was filled with great driving roads. Think of it as a Canadian canyon. Anyway, there was this one huge dip in the road that if you got up enough speed, you could jump it and land softly on the crest of the following hill. The poor Shelby had done this effortlessly thousands of times. Not sure what factors led to the Shelby's epic fail on that faithful night, but it didn't clear the dip. The poor car came down so hard that the struts came up and ejected the hood right off the car. Dan, being 16 at the time, was apprehended by local law enforcement and his dad had to come and get him. Thankfully, Dan and the Shelby survived. In Dan's case, survived the beating his father gave him. Dan eventually sold the car to our friend Sean, who restored the car and gave it to his sister. Not sure whatever happened to it after that. The GLH, GLHT, GLHSs, and the Shelby Charger were all awesome cars. And I can't believe how inexpensive they still are in 2022. High time for a second look. History. Like many performance cars, the Omni GLH and Shelby Charger had humble roots. The base Omni was like ordering a Volkswagen Rabbit from Wish. During development, Chrysler actually purchased around 100 Volkswagen Rabbits to reverse engineer them. 1978 to 1983 Omnis even had a variant of the EA827 Volkswagen engine. The engine block was built by Volkswagen with Chrysler designed cylinder head. These early cars had either a Volkswagen 4-speed manual or a Chrysler A404 3-speed automatic. In 1979, Chrysler introduced the Dodge Omni 024 and the Plymouth Horizon TC3. They were two-door hatchback coupe versions of the Omni Horizon. They used the same L-body chassis but shortened it to a 96.6-inch wheelbase. In 1981, the Charger name was resurrected as a $399 optional performance package on the Omni 024. Dodge called it the Charger 2.2. It came with a hood scoop, rear spoiler, specific sail panels, specific gearing, and Charger 2.2 vinyl graphics. The Charger was powered by the all-new 84 horsepower 2.2 liter L4 four-cylinder engine that was designed and built in-house by Chrysler. In 1983, the Omni's base engine was a snooze-fest Simca-designed engine supplied by Peugeot, with a whopping 62 horsepower and 85 foot-pounds of torque. Thank the car gods, things took a turn to Omni performance starting in 1981. The car gods, man. With the Chrysler 2.2 liter. Things started off lukewarm in 1981 with 84 horsepower and 111 foot-pounds of torque. In 1986, things got a little warmer with 96 horsepower and 119 foot-pounds of torque. In 1988, a jump to a solid warmish with 93 horsepower and 122 foot-pounds of torque. Shelby turned up the heat in 1983 with the Shelby Charger with 107 horsepower. Things started getting hotter with the introduction of the Chrysler K high output 2.2 liter in 1984 with 110 horsepower and 129 foot-pounds of torque for the Dodge Omni GLH and Dodge Shelby Charger. Finally, things came to a boil in 1985 when Chrysler introduced the K Turbo 2.2 liter. The 85 Shelby Charger Turbo and the 85 Omni GLH T produced 146 horsepower. Carol Shelby's GLHSs, Omni and Charger, were red hot with 175 horsepower. Shelby Charger In 1983, Carol Shelby sold a modified version of the Dodge Charger at Dodge dealerships called a Dodge Shelby Charger. Initially, the focus wasn't speed, it was appearance and handling. Shelby modified the styling and suspension. Styling-wise, a new front fascia, body kit, and racing stripes boosted the car's performance image. Performance-wise, Shelby Charger got a free-flowing exhaust system with more rumble. The engine's compression ratio was raised, which also raised the horsepower to 107. The manual transmission got revised ratios for greater performance. The suspension received lowering springs, a quicker 14-to-1 power steering rack, special 15-inch wheels, tires, and bigger brakes. Whole Carol's recipe was a great success, with 8,251 1983 Shelby Chargers being sold. In 1984, there were 7,552 Shelby Chargers sold. The Chrysler K high output engine was introduced in 1984 and was fitted to the Shelby Charger. The high output engine had 110 horsepower. In 1985, the Shelby Charger got the multi-port fuel-injected turbocharged Turbo One engine. The Turbo One engine produced 146 horsepower. The Turbo One engine first appeared a year earlier in the 142 horsepower Dodge Daytona Turbo Z. 
The heart of the Turbo One was a Garrett Air Research T3 turbocharger and Chrysler Bosch multi-port fuel injection system. 7,709 Shelby chargers were made for the 1985 model year, followed by 7,669 in 1986. The Shelby Chargers came in four different color combinations. Blue with a silver stripe from 1983 to 1986. Santa Fe Silver with a Santa Fe Blue stripe from 1983 to 1986. Garnet Red with a silver stripe from 1984 to 1987. And Black with a silver stripe from 1984 to 1987. They say all good things come to an end, and 1987 was the final year of Shelby Charger, with just 1,011 produced. 1,000 more Shelby Chargers were sent to Shelby's Whittier plant in California to be transformed into 1987 Shelby GLHSs. 1987 Shelby GLHS. Carol Shelby took a play out of Henry Ford's playbook, and I quote, Any customer can have a car painted any color that he wants, as long as it is black. Carol took it one step further, having every GLHS built and optioned the same. They were all bad Shelby, not Dodge. There was so much Shelby content and so little Dodge that the federal government declared the car a Shelby model. Shelby used the Turbo 1 engine, which he updated with an intercooler and plumbing from the upcoming Turbo 2 engine. The engine had a blow-through long-runner two-piece intake manifold and a modified T3 turbocharger which was reclocked with a different compressor housing. Shelby rated the engine at 175 horsepower and 175 foot pounds of torque from 2400 to 4800 RPM. The suspension upgrades consisted of Coney adjustable struts and shocks and Shelby's own Centurion two wheels shod with Goodyear Eagle GTZ rated tires. A 125 mile an hour speedometer was added and a special numbered Shelby automotive plaque went in place of the charger badge in the interior. Dodge Omni GLH. From 1984 to 1986, the highest performance Dodge Omni was the Omni GLH. The GLH was modified by Carroll Shelby. Carroll rejected Chrysler's plan name for the car, Coyote, and added his own, GLH. In perhaps the worst kept automotive secret ever, GLH stood for Goes Like Hell. For 1984, the Omni GLH borrowed heavily from the 1983 Shelby Charger parts bin, including its 110 horsepower 2.2 liter high output engine, lowering springs, wider tires, and larger brakes. Omni GLHT. In 1985 and 1986, the GLHT, T for turbo, got the 146 horsepower 2.2 liter turbo 1 engine. Omni GLHS. In typical Shelby fashion, GLHS stood for Goes Like Hell Some More. Shelby Automobiles bought the final 500 black 1986 GLHTs to transform them into Shelby GLHSs. The highly modified GLHSs were sold as Shelbys, not Dodges. The Turbo One engine borrowed the intercooler, turbocharger, throttle body, wiring harness, intake exhaust manifolds, new radiator, and cooling fan from the upcoming 1987 Turbo Two engine. The suspension was further upgraded with higher rate springs, adjustable Coney struts and shocks, and Shelby design wheels with larger tires. The GLHS had silver pinstripes and badging. A Shelby windshield banner and large GLHS decal was added to the driver's side C-pillar. Shelby would have put one on the passenger side C-pillar too, but there was a gas filler door in the way. Stock performance. Motor Week tested a 1985 Shelby Charger, and it did the quarter mile in 16 seconds at 86 miles per hour. And did 0-60 to 60 in 7.9 seconds. 0 to 60 timescom had a good overview of stock performance of all the variants. Racing! GLHs and Shelby Chargers are often drag raced. That Shelby Charger took that GLH to Gapplebee's. Shelby Chargers and GLHSs are often autocrossed. The GLH is great for rally racing. The Shelby Charger was quite successful at land speed racing.
Perhaps the best use of one of these cars is to bomb down a country road on a beautiful summer's day. Hey, what was that? Holy crap, another jackalope sighting! a GLH Shelby Charger. There are a few things to look out for on these cars. Body. The tin worm likes to eat the frame rails, floorboards, fuel filler neck, and under the side skirts. Make sure to check these areas. Electrical. Original alternators are problematic. It is a popular mod to convert to a Denso or Bosch alternator to avoid issues. It is not unusual for the engine loom and relays on turbo cars to have issues due to the amount of heat they have been subjected to over the years. Ignition systems are a weak spot. It would be a good idea to add a fresh distributor cap, distributor rotor, ignition wires, and spark plugs. Engine. Naturally aspirated versions are pretty robust, but many turbo models have been beaten within an inch of their lives, boosted to the moon. It would be a good idea to look for signs of a leaking head gasket and complete a compression test. Hydraulic flash adjusters are a common failure point. A telltale sign of a bad one is ticking noises in the valve train. Mercifully, they're easy to replace and inexpensive. Transmission. Shift linkage bushings tend to wear out and cause shifting issues. A common mod is to convert to a cable-operated shifter from a pre-1987 K platform car, or add heim joints to the original linkages. Cost. Haggerty claims the average value of a 1986 Dodge Omni GLH Turbo to be $9,200. They also claim a 1986 Dodge Omni GLHS's average value to be $21,500. Oddly, the Shelby Charger is not on Haggerty's radar yet. For shame. JD Power claims the average value of a 1987 Shelby Charger to be $6,650. They also claim the average value of a 1987 Shelby GLHS to be $14,600. Whichever one you decide on, you better get it fast as these cars are sure to go up in value. Thanks for watching Jason Bowman Loves Cars and my story of the Omni GLH and the Shelby Charger. Please remember to like, subscribe, and comment.